Greatest Point, welcome, welcome, welcome. Come on in. Let's stand up. We're so glad you are with us today. If you're feeling heavy from the week, some weight that you uh, you don't want to be carrying, let's uh, let's take a big deep breath in. Let it out. We can release it. Be here. Exist together in this space. And uh, we love you. Let's sing it together. If you're lost and you're lonely, go and figure out why. Take a trip to the dark side, go on and have a good cry. Cause we're all lonely, we're all lonely together. I wanna see your sadness, I wanna share your sin. I want to bleed your blood and I want to be let in. Don't you just, don't we all just want to be together? All right, let's sing it.
We hope you can do that uh, with us today. What we'd love for you to do right now is find some, somebody maybe that you haven't talked to before, introduce yourself, have a conversation. I know I'm, I see some people, I'm going to hug some necks, but I will be back in just a couple minutes. Yeah, meet and greet. Hi, Grace Point. Good morning. Buenos dias. Bienvenidos a Grace Point. Estamos muy bien. Okay. Well, Grace Point, good morning. My name is Andy. Uh, my pronouns are he and him. I'm super excited once again to share the announcements. I'm sorry. <laughs> that was a joke. It didn't, it didn't land. It. Sorry for that. Um, before we proceed with the announcements, I want to make a special acknowledgement of our online community. So please turn your faces to the camera and say hi to our online community. Okay. So everything that I'm going to be talking about today, it's going to be in the QR code. So you can scan it on the screen on the postcards in your shares. But also, I would like to share a little bit reflection because for me it's important. We are currently celebrating Hispanic Heritage Month here in the U.S. So... Uh, we celebrate the rich cultural, cultural diversity and contributions of our Hispanic brothers and sisters. Let us come together in unity, learning from each other, and appreciating the beauty of our shared faith and heritage. Viva la herencia hispana. Okay, awesome, great. Um, so right now we have two book studies. One is uh, lead by our friend, um, Ricky Brady and Josh's book, The uh, Bible Stories for Grownups, okay? And then we have another book study that is being led by Tiffany Dowdy on 
uh, How Embracing Queerness Will Transform Your Faith by Reverend Mihi Kim Court. Okay, so if you still want to join, you can do it. So please make sure to scan the QR code and you're going to be able to participate on the book studies. I'm super excited about this. I'm going to be very honest. We have an amazing group of people that are gathering today after the 11 a.m. service is the most energetic people in the entire room, which is our people from Salt and Pepper. Do we have any Salt and Peppers today here? Yeah. yeah, that's the attitude. That's right. So if you like high energy, deep conversations, you can join them today at the Wedge after the service. And also this coming Wednesday, we're going to have Reimagine at 6 p.m. if you want to join. And there's some more fun stuff coming along. On October 29th, Margaret, Margaret Calendars, we're going to have our next community social. Um, it's going to be, we're going to have our 9 a.m. service, normal. And then from 11 to 1 p.m., we'll have the full festival, okay? We're going to do some truck, trunk retreat for our kids and their families. There are also going to be games, food, and something for everyone. So if you want to participate in the trunk retreat, uh, we'll be sharing more information so you can sign up for that activity. Uh, Last but not least, uh, I want to make also an acknowledgement. Last week, we were celebrating 20 years anniversary. And I just want to recognize and say thank you to everyone of this community that supported us. We raised over $24,000 last week. Okay. So here in Grace Point, our goal is to create a safe, affirming, and transformative community. To those who already financially support us, thank you so much. And if you want to support us, here's how you can do it. You can text any dollar amount to 84321. You can go online and give uh, gracepoint.net slash give. You can scan the QR code or you can Venmo us at gracepointtn. So enjoy the service. Thanks. Hey, I'm Tiffany. Uh, pronouns are she, they. I'm our director of our... Kids and students in college and things and lead a book study and all the awesomeness. So today, or not today, this moment is for our kids moment. So I'm going to ask our volunteers to help. We only have one volunteer out here um, to get our cushions. And if you are a kid, like for real, not just at heart, but if you are a child and you want to come up to the front, we have your cushions ready and it is almost time to go to the back. Go ahead. Uh-huh. Thanks for pushing up your chair. That was awesome. If you're online and you have a kid, this is the time that you would bring your kid to like pay attention, I guess, maybe if they haven't been before that. But yeah, we really love our cushions apparently today. Okay, sweet. No one else is joining us. That's fine. Okay, guys, you ready? Oh, we're just going to take a nap. I, you may not be able to see this, but we have lounged in the front now. Okay, so today we are finishing, finishing up Fruits of the Spirit. Do you know what Fruits of the Spirit are? The Holy Spirit? That's a great answer. Anything else? When you hear fruit, what do you think of? God? That, not that you are thriving right now. Your dad is very proud of you. Okay, what are your favorite fruits? Well, favorite fruit. Do you know what a fruit is? I'm just like, strawberry. Strawberry? RJ, what's your favorite fruit? Uh, grapes. Grapes. You ready? Um, my favorite fruit is banana. 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 If you did not see what just happening in the sibling world, he had to be told his favorite fruit in his ear. Okay, so do you like fruits? Do you like fruits? Yeah, I love fruits. My favorite fruit is actually this fruit called kiwi. Have you ever seen that before? It's like fuzzy on the outside, green on the inside, all those things. Okay, those are not the fruits we're talking about, though. Do you know what we're talking about? Fruits of the Spirit. It's so confusing. It's not a grape. It's not an apple. It's not a pineapple. It's not a banana. It's not a watermelon. It's definitely not a strawberry. It's not a strawberry. So when we say fruit of the spirit, I'm meaning love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and gentleness and faithfulness and self-control and all of these other things. But today we're talking about two of them. We're talking about gentleness. Which one are we talking about today? Awesome. And we're talking about self-control. Do you know what those words mean? What do they mean? Yeah, think about doing something before you do it. 
okay? So today we're going to talk about one very specific thing. Have you ever, and this is for everyone in the room, have you ever had someone say something to you that hurt your feelings? Yes? Raise your hand. Look, look at all them. I've had people hurt my feelings. Now raise your hand. This is the hard part. Raise your hand if you have ever done or said something that hurt someone else's feelings. By accident, yeah, and that's okay. So, cushions on the ground, five, four, three, very good job. Okay, I need you to be very gentle with your cushions. Do you know what that means? To be easy with them, right? So when we talk about gentleness and self-control, you ready, cushions on the ground, there you go. Gentleness and self-control, I need you to practice it right now. Good, you knew exactly what to do, right? We calm down, we slow down, and we think before we act. So one of the ways that we can love other people, do you know another way we can love other people? Is by practicing gentleness with our words and our actions and practicing self-control. I feel really loved right now when you listen and when you're paying attention and when you're looking at me, it lets me know that you love me enough to listen. And my way of loving you is by being here and we're going to do snacks, don't worry. And we're going to have all the games, okay? Can we practice that? Okay, what are the two words? Gentleness. What's the other one? Self-control. Very good job. Sweet. Okay, y'all ready? Let's line up at the door. Bring your cushions. If you are a kid, fifth grade and under, we invite you to go ahead and come back. Um, if you are sixth grade and up, you will go to student ministry, which will be announced on a slide, but not yet. So fifth grade and under will come this way. Thanks, adults, for participating. All the children. We love the children. We're so glad that you are here today. Will y'all stand back up with us? We're going to do um, a song together. Some of you, if you grew up in the church and are familiar with hymns, this is a the melody of a hymn called Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. And a friend of Grace Point, um, her name is Alana Sabatini. She's an amazing artist, um, queer artist. And she rewrote uh, the lyrics to this song. Um, made it very personal, but it definitely applies to, to us here. So let's sing this together.
Test, test, good. Uh, Cassie, two weeks in a row. Um, How about that? Spoiled. So good to have her home. Stan, two weeks in a row. Well, uh, <laughs> that, that's where I was kind of leading with that. <laughs> Thanks for doing it. <laughs> good morning, everybody. Uh, good to see familiar faces and home folk. I also see a good number of new folk, and we welcome you. I'm, uh, for those that don't know, I'm Stan Mitchell. I am not Josh Scott. Um, Josh Scott, our pastor, is off somewhere speaking today. He's a book author, and a lot of people love Josh. It's really lovely. I was in a church two weeks ago in Phoenix, and they were up announcing their book club, and people were all excited about a book club, and the book was Josh Scott, the recent one he just wrote, and I know he's writing another. So Josh is out and about. He's more than, um, he's more than just our pastor. He extends our message and our love to a lot of places, and we want him to do that. There's always a question about how much a, a lead pastor is gone. I personally think um, we're past the, the days when we think a lead pastor has to be our own Superman. And this community, this community by extending him and sending him out, I really do believe, the, to use an old phrase, to uh, twist on it, the light that shines the farthest shines the brightest at home. And when he's shining our light out there, he's shining brightly at home. Um, I do have some history here. A group of us started this church 20 years ago, and it's still like the greatest honor of my life. So I, as a pastor emeritus, retired pastor, do my best. I have two responsibilities, and that's to serve at the behest of Josh and the board and the leadership, and mostly just to stay out of the way and to not be, not to be the old coach that moves on to general manager and turns into Jerry Jones for all you football fans. <laughs> Appreciate y'all getting that. And for those that don't, it was a good one. Uh, ask, somebody that, <laughs> ask somebody that laughed later. So I want to talk about something really important. Um, and let me just preface it with something some may not understand. A lot of us will. But I just want to state where I'm going because this is not the... This is one of those messages and concepts that's easier to taste than it is to say. And... But I, I hope I can say it in a way that will be provocative and, and helpful. But I, we are a part of a movement of progressive Christianity, especially a progressive Christianity coming out of evangelical settings. Where a lot of folk from Catholic backgrounds, Orthodox backgrounds, but mostly Protestant evangelical backgrounds. 
And this movement um, as a part of the body of Christ is 20, 30, 40 years old. But one thing that I notice about our movement is, and I laud us because communities like Grace Point are a great place for people to do what we call deconstruct. This is a great place for people who are weaning off dualism and literalism and especially conservative um, messaging about Christianity, and they're trying to find a new way. There's also, our church has been really good for a lot of LGBTQ folk who experience a lot of negativity and wounds with Christianity. There are tons of those folk who are never going to come back to anything church, not anytime soon. And there are others that less than triggered by this, they, they need healing in the very place where they were most deeply hurt. And I think, I think our circles do really well for people moving what I will in this message refer to using Paul Ricoeur, the French existentialist, uh, his language, people moving from first naivete to criticism and sophistication, people moving from pre-critical type religious thought to critical religious thought. And by critical, I mean that in a good way, thoughtful. People who found out that they can open their heart and not have to check their brain at the door when they come in. And, and we're especially good for that. One thing I do notice in our circles is that we have a tendency, and this is natural, there's nothing wrong with this, but we have a tendency to get stuck in criticism and sophistication, and we get stuck in, and our creed actually sounds like all of the things we don't believe. And our creed is more defined by those things that we aren't anymore. And I think the question that begs in our circles, the natural question is, well, what do we believe? I know what we don't believe about God and the resurrection and atonement and all of that stuff, but have, have we replaced those things with, uh, through imagination and curiosity and open hearts, new ideas that are comforting? Because theology and the way we look at God and life provides us with things like comfort and direction. I mean... We, we all have real lives. I will leave this afternoon and head over to Arkansas and be with my mom of 55 years who doesn't know my name anymore and be with a dad who's dealing with Parkinson's, a new diagnosis that makes his life with mom and caring for her all the more difficult. And I, I'm not deeply comforted by all the things that I don't believe. I don't find meaning and direction and solace, sucker in, in all of the things that I'm not. I, I wonder, Mary, what do I believe? I may not believe those things, but do I believe other things? And I think personally, our movement, and it's a movement that's a couple of hundred years old, from mainline liberal denominations to Unitarian Universalists to the Unity Church to religious science to this post-evangelical iteration, we're all just looking and imagining that Jesus was saying something better and deeper than what we've understood to this point. But I, I think there is not a crisis in the movement, but I think there is a call in the movement to not just provide space for people who are moving out of pre-critical thought to critical thought, but I think we also have to provide space for our own souls for people moving from critical thought to post-critical thought. From, from the rejection of what we did think to an opening to what we may think new. Moving from a, a liberal legal, legalism Okay, because I do see that a lot. We moved from one narrowness to another narrowness. We opened our minds in deconstruction, but the more we opened our minds, the angrier we got about what we had been taught. And it's, it's like there was this horrible convergence. The more open-minded we got, the narrower our hearts got. And that's a natural response to wounding. With wounds come scars. With blisters that hurt, the body responds by giving calluses and and calluses are better than blisters but you can't feel with calluses the nerves are gone and so the call now for us is can we provide a space for people coming out of exclusivistic fear-based religion who have wounds that do need to be tended who have wounds that need to be closed and scarring that does need to occur and and there are perhaps calluses that have to happen 
But for those of us who have been in that process and for those who go into that process is sophistication and critical thought and anger and being bereft of all those narrownesses, is that the end game? Or, as I wrote this morning on a little Facebook post, and I will commence my thoughts, Paul Ricoeur, that existentialist I just mentioned, said, beyond the desert of criticism, and it is a desert, Beyond the desert of criticism, our hearts long to be called again. I wrote, and so that moment finally comes. That moment when you just know jadedness has robbed you of enough. Cynicism has exacted too high a price on your heart. A resentful, closed, suspicious soul is too much to carry through life. And in that moment, you cautiously, warily consider opening your heart again. You tow the threshold of the experience Jesus named to become again as a child. Dare he say, to even be born again. And as you show that threshold, you stand there bankrupted, impoverished, emptied, submitted, yielded, worn out from your resistance. You realize you've replaced one narrowness with another narrowness, one pain for another pain, one legalism for another legalism, one certainty for another certainty. And perhaps you near that state of becoming again as a child. That state of being born again, that very label you long ago outgrew. Perhaps now you tow the threshold of a new bravery. It is not the bravery of opening your mind and the world says keep it closed. It is the bravery of opening a heart that has been deeply wounded. A soul brave enough to risk loving again, believing again. And perhaps here you can be brave enough to risk the potential of heartache and perish the heart, the thought, even heartbreak again. Except you become as a little child, Jesus said, you just can't see. For those of you that know what I do, I extend the work of Grace Point around the country And I spend most of my life working with people that internally, using Jesus and Bible language, I describe as the people of Silent Saturday. And by Silent Saturday, I'm referring, of course, to that day between Good Friday crucifixion and Sunday morning resurrection. Silent Saturday people are people who live in the vulnerable space following the loss of the only Jesus they've ever known folk who are trying to figure out if Jesus is still real. People who live in the vulnerable space following the loss of the only idea of God and spirituality and the afterlife they've ever known, who are living in that silent space of Saturday, that space when everything you've loved has been buried, that space where you haven't experienced resurrection yet, you don't even know that there be a resurrection People who are trying to figure out, this is who I live with, and this is in great part who Grace Point does really well with. People who are trying to figure out, should I just move on and never look back, or should I at least spend some time at the tomb, the burial site of everything I held dear? Is church a place where I look for a stone to roll away, or maybe church is a place where I just go like the women who loved him, to put burial spices on a life that may never live again, but it deserves not to stink. There are a lot of reasons why people like us gather. Should I just get on with life and forget all of that stuff? Or should I at least take a bit of time and gently tend to a corpse of faith? One obviously no longer alive 
the one that I don't feel right allowing to decay. I spend a lot of time with people like us, queer kids who write from little towns in North Dakota and Delaware and say my dad's a Southern Baptist preacher and I don't want to live. And I don't know whether to pray if there's anyone to pray to because the only one I've ever been taught to pray to was part of my greatest wounding. I spend a lot of time with people like the women who went to the tomb that first Easter morning. Women who went to the tomb not because they had a deep sense of conviction that a stone would roll away and a body would resurrect, but women who went to that tomb simply with the thought that many of us come to places like this with, the thought he may not have been who we thought he was, but I'm not ready to say he was nothing. Spirituality, thoughts about the afterlife and the world beyond and meaning in a mother's Alzheimer and struggling with your child's cancer. The answers may be different now. The quest for meaning and all of that may lead to different places, but is there still a quest there? Everyone deals with this space in their own way, and it's a holy space. Silent Saturday folk, disoriented folk, are those who live somewhere between Good Friday and Easter Sunday, that most tender of spaces fixed between letting go and rebirth, between the death of everything we knew and held dear and the discovery of a beauty we could scarcely have dreamed. I don't do sermons a lot anymore. I just walk away from moments with that kid in North Dakota and sit down and write to do my own autotherapy because it's the only way I can deal with the fact that I've done 25 funerals in the last 37 months of queer people of the 25, 21 of them were under the age of 21. And every one of them, the high correlative of their death was religion. So I don't write sermons a lot anymore. But after those kinds of funerals, I, I walk long trails and I think about us. And I think about what we're trying to do at Grace Point. And I think about how differently people deal with this painful dying of faith, this painful dying of Jesus and church and God and the Bible. And, and I, I find that some are mostly angry and others are drowned by the sadness. And then there are others, and I don't know how much of this is personality, I, I don't know. Beekner is right, if theology has three parts, at least two of them are autobiography. I find a lot of people like us who are still in the midst of our anger and sadness, we're still hopeful there could be a chance for reunion. And then there are others who just bitterly write the whole damn thing off and are just done. And I get it. Don't think I haven't thought it. Some are like the disciples, those confused, hurt fellows who went. You remember the 11? Judas now gone. Those confused, hurt fellows who get the bulk of the story in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Those confused, hurt fellows who went as far and as quickly as they could from Golgotha, the place where their dreams and faith were skewered and hung on a cross and buried in a borrowed tomb. The men disciples didn't even wait for him to die so they could tend to his burial. They left that decent work to kind strangers. And that's true. So many of us have left. We end up in 12 steps in therapy with people who aren't in the church and they're using Jesus stuff. And we think, wait, what? We run as far as we can from it, leaving those strangers to tend to Jesus maybe more intimately and better, Mike, than we ever did. I remember the first time sitting in the 12-step meeting thinking, they ripped us off. And then I thought, well, we weren't using Jesus' stuff, so somebody should have. <laughs> and then there are others 
who lost him that first Easter weekend who dealt with their loss differently. His mom. I mean, everybody has a different relationship with Jesus. And by Jesus, I mean, think Christ, think God, think paradigms and archetypes bigger than one bronze-skinned Galilean. I'm talking about spirituality. I'm talking about a message that a, a fundamentalist Buddhist kid or Hindu kid or could listen to and say, I get that. I think about those like his mother. She had been with him the longest and, and arguably had lost the most. When he was in her womb, he was causing her pain more than the physical. She had this whole story she couldn't even share with the people closest. When she shared it with Joseph, he sought to put her away. She was told by the angel, it's the most beautiful part of your life, but don't tell anybody. When he was born, she took him to the temple, and Simeon, this old wise man, held him up and then looked at her. And surely with eyes glistening, looked at her and said, the sword that pierces his soul, or the sword that pierces his side will pierce yours also. He was just a baby. And he's already predicting he's going to break your heart in ways you can't imagine. And yet, this woman who stood on the outskirts of a crowd and said, would you tell my son I want to see him? And he sends a message back and says, tell her these are my mothers and these are my brothers. And her heart breaks. Her own children say, mom, don't tell that story anymore about the angel and all of that stuff, it makes you sound crazy, as crazy as he is right now. I think about his mom quietly standing there at the cross, looking up at him, saying, this hasn't been easy. From the time I conceived you, this hasn't been easy. And you better believe, a million times I've wanted to run as far as I could from you. But I hate you and I love you. I can't live with you and I can't live without you, boy. I think about Peter. He walks on water. Jesus sadly tells his disciples, you guys are all going to do what Judas did before it's over. It's just part of the process. It'll be okay. And Peter says, no, 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 not me. Though everybody, not me. I'll die and go to prison with you. And three hours later, a woman walks up to him and says, don't you belong to Jesus? And he says, no, I don't know the guy. And the second time they said, no, I think your speech betrays your Galilean. I've seen you with him. And he said, I don't know what you're talking about. Jesus is getting beaten and whipped. And Peter, who a few hours before said, hey, I'm the water walker. You gave me the keys of the kingdom. <laughs> Though all of these deny you, not me. And now he's standing there in the third time, Lee. They say, no, you're one of his. And he said, blankety, blank, blank. I don't know the blankety, blank. And that rooster crows. And he remembers Jesus told him, before the rooster crows the second time, you'll deny me thrice. And his, oh, God, Casey, his heart breaks. And, and he, he doesn't join Jesus' mother at the cross. But a few days later in a boat, toiling and rowing, he sees somebody on the shore. And he strips off his clothes and he jumps in the water because he knows it's going to be a hard swim. And he gets to shore and there on the shore is Jesus. I can see him tending a bit of charred fish in the fire and he doesn't even look up and Peter squats down beside him. Shame. Guilt. And Jesus turns the fish and hands him a bit on a leaf. And Jesus says, lovest thou me more than these? And if he would have been honest, he would have said, you know, I don't know. I don't know. I didn't know. I don't know anything now. But lovest thou me more than these? And he says, I do. 
And Jesus stokes the fire and whispers, Lovest thou me more than these? And Peter knows that he's not going to get off easy because this thing of soul making, this thing of untwisting Jesus and religion and spirituality and your mom's Alzheimer's and the vicissitudes of life and the afterlife. And Peter whispers, I do, I do. And Jesus doesn't say, okay, well, let's, get, let's start over. Jesus looks at him now and says, lovest thou me more than these? And his heart breaks, and he says, please, just leave me alone. You know I love you. But you know what's lost in all of that? In the Greek, they know better than have one word. In, in original Greek, they knew better than have one word for love. Because we say, I love peach cobbler, and I love my child, right? I love chocolate pudding, and I love, you know, God, Original Greeks, Mike, they knew better than that. And they had four words for love. Agapao is that downward reaching love of a parent for a child where you know you don't have a lot of nobility, but there's a couple of people, one of them sitting right back there that I'd jump in front of a bullet for. You guys, I don't know, I hope, but <laughs> Stan Jr., I just would jump in front of a bullet for him. If he hated me, I'd jump in front of a bullet for him. That's agapao. That's the love that's unconditional. That just. But then there's phileo. Phileo is not that unconditional downreaching love. It's, phile it's Philadelphia, the city of sibling love. It's this mutuality. If then we love one another, there's reciprocity. One doesn't have to love more than the other. We get and we take and we receive and we give and it's reciprocity. And then there's eros. Eros, we think of erotic, but eros is the upward reaching love. It's the love of a drowning person for a life jacket. And, and the amazing thing about eros, it squeezes tightly, but that's not a hug. It kisses, but it's actually vampiric and drawing blood. Agape is downward reaching. Phileo is side. Eros is upward reaching and needy eros is loving peach cobbler i don't love peach cobbler for its sake i mean eros is when you love beef agape is when you love cows big difference jesus didn't say lovest thou me jesus said agapao thou me and peter said in the in the original Jesus said, Agapa, without me, Peter did not say. He had learned enough those hard days. He did not say, I agapa owe you. Peter said, I fillet owe you. Wow. The second time, Jesus stood seemingly on behalf of every conservative religion that's ever stood and simply said, well, that's not good enough. And the second time, Jesus said, Agapa, owe thou me. And Simon didn't give in to the bullying of legalism and Phariseeism and demand. Simon knew he had already lied once and it didn't turn out well. Simon said, the second time, I fillet owe you. And the third time, Jesus whispered, fillet owe thou me? Instead of the ultimate demand that makes Simon lie, Representing all things good in God, Jesus lets go of the ultimate demand and comes to where Simon is and says, Phileo, thou me. And he breaks and says, yes, sir. I don't know that I'll ever get you back in a second person in the Trinity. I don't know if I'll ever get you back in a Wesleyan Pentecostal Protestant Christian. I don't know if I'll ever get you back in the creeds and catechisms of my life. I don't know if I'll ever get you back there. But this earthly, yes. And Jesus comes to that and says, that'll do just fine. And they start again. I live my life, and this church has been built for 20 years. We celebrated our 20th anniversary last week. This church has been built for 20 years for people stumbling out of the Gospels 
Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John's first 90% written about walking around with a guy who had all the answers and was performing miracles and our churches were growing. <laughs> we got together with our families, we agreed on everything, and my dad still asked me to pray for the meal. He doesn't ask me to pray for the meal anymore. I miss those days. I miss those days when my dad with Parkinson's and I could talk about mom and we could find equivalent comfort in the same story. I miss the Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John of walking around with Jesus and knowing exactly who he was and who God was and how the afterlife was going to turn out. I do miss that certainty. There was comfort in that. Now, there's a lot about it that I don't miss. I don't miss the fear. I don't miss watching my queer friends leave devastated. I don't watch, miss watching people of color and women treated like second-class citizens. I don't, I don't miss messages about really good people of other religions not having the truth. I don't, there's tons of all that. I don't miss when I was in fourth grade one day feeling my hair on my ears and having a panic attack because I thought the rapture might take place and I would miss it because of the length of my hair. I don't miss that. I don't miss second grade and the spastic colon that made me miss 25 days of school. And when they got to the bottom of it, the school counselor found out it was obsession with religious fear. Seven years old. I don't miss it. But it wasn't all that, was it? It wasn't always. It wasn't all a sword that pierced Mary's side. It wasn't. There's parts of it I, I do miss. And sages have described this experience as a lot. But I just wanted to come today just to tell you this. And Josh is going to pick up in the next few weeks. He's going to do a series that really is wonderful coming out of this. This church and churches like it, if Christianity is going to exist and if it's going to withstand good human evolution, species evolution, Christianity, and it's not going to be in the next hundred years, and as long as there is a lack of exposure to the broader, broader universe, there's always going to be a place for fear-based religion. But I'm just telling you, for Christianity, Europe has proved it, Canada's proved it, our coast are proving it. If Christianity is going to exist and thrive, it's going to have to mature and grow up. And it's going to have to move out of literalism and dualism and fear and exclusivism. Those things are going to have to go the way of wisdom, teeth, and appendixes. And these days, as someone who is a sentimentalist and nostalgia, I am within my religion. And I am fighting tooth and toenail, doing my best to believe that we can do better that we can really grow into the fullness of Jesus' message that was not about Buddhist people going to hell and burning forever because they didn't have the truth. I, I sometimes wonder in this space, am I an occupational therapist trying to help Christianity get to a better place and be able to function more fully? Or am I doing palliative hospice care for something that I love dearly that just needs to die as peacefully as it can and go away? And I'm telling you, the religion that put these 25 people in the grave the last 36 months, the ones that I directly did, that religion needs to go away. The world's better off without it. But my God, I feel like Mary there at the foot of that cross saying, this has been a hard road. I feel like Peter around that campfire saying, this has been shitty in so many ways. But there is a ring of essential truth here. There is something There's something that I think even when I have decided to let go of it, I'll be doggone, it won't let go of me. This church has been really, really good, and churches like ours has been really, really good about helping people move from first naivete and say, that is not where I want to live. From pre-critical, literalistic religion, we've been really good about giving people a safe space to say, I don't believe all of that stuff, and I want to heal from it. We've been really great there. But I think there's another call. I think there is a call to move past the woundings, not past the woundings because they will ever be inside of us. But there is a call to move away 
from the thicknesses of calluses that can no longer feel. I mean, the good news is they can't hurt. The bad news is they can't feel. You know what I'm saying? This has been a place that has helped tender, brutalized people close the wound and keep it from being gangrenous and septic. And we have, we have relished the fact that we allow people to develop scars. And that scar symbolizes for me a place that where it once hurt so deeply I couldn't touch it. But now I touch it and can't feel anything. Ricoeur said, as surely as we move in our maturity from pre-critical thought to critical thought, we must... At some point in our healing, at some point in the thickness of scars and calluses and cataracts, the cataracts that actually kept us from a, the glare of something too bright and harsh to see, something that would have burned the retinas out of our spiritual eyes. There is a call to move past that thickness to a new tenderness that Ricoeur called second naivete. And it's the ability to take the mindful thoughtfulness of critical lenses, but with them in tow, recapture the awe and the wonder and the imagination and the curiosity and the belief in beauty and truth and love. A parable to close. When my son's sister, seven years his junior, she's now 18, when she was... 10 or 11, too old, but I think about fifth grade, she came home one day, hands on hips, and she looked at me, and Stan, you can hear her, she said, I know, and I said, I remember exactly where I was, I said, you know what, that day in fifth grade, she had found out that North Poles and flying reindeers and Chubby guys in red suits don't slide down chimneys. She, two years or three years past the average age, people find this out, found it out. There had been a process in her life for whatever parental reason to keep her in the garden of a literal Santa Claus as long as we could. It gave her two or three years of elves on the shelf and a lot of joy. But I'll never forget the day she came home, hands on the hip, and said, I know. As I processed through that experience with her over the next weeks and even months and even maybe a year, I want to, I want to tell you what I noticed about her. And it stands as an allegory for those of us who have taken this pre-critical, critical journey. When someone in school, and then reaffirmed by others in school, when her group of friends got around her incredulously and said, it's time that you know. Her first reaction, tell me if you remember this, Southern Baptist, Nazarene, Assembly of God, Protestant, Conservative, Catholics. Tell me if you remember this. When she first got wind of critical thought about Santa Claus, she was shocked. She denied it, and then she was shocked because she couldn't. You know what her next reaction, emotional reaction was? She was sad. That had been such a beautiful part of her life, a part she never questioned, a part that meant so much. Shock quickly turned to sadness. You know what followed sadness? Say it. Anger. Anger. She cast a wry, wary eye toward the adults. And she knew that it was all about capitalism, commercialism, and money. <laughs> she wondered how we could dupe her. She was angry. And then something I didn't suspect would happen, but it happened, and it was amazing to see. She was embarrassed. Because now she had to face everybody new except me, and I look like a fool. 
And the way she dealt with that sad, angry embarrassment was she became a zealot that was going to keep kids everywhere from ever being duped. And I remember it came to a head stand at Justin's house, my best friend with the three kids that are like her little cousins, several years younger, as they were talking one day about their elves on the shelf, I watched my daughter. I watched the intensity of her glare as she looked at us and knew she was about to pull them into a room and save them from the legalism of Santa Claus. As she pulled them aside, I remember my friend Justin looking at me. I mean, these were small kids looking at me like, help, don't let her do this. I got her out of there. She knew what had happened. We got in the car, and she stared out the window. And I didn't know what to say as a parent, but it finally hit me what to say, and I said it, and it began a healing for her. I said, I need to tell you something, and she said, what? And I said, I believe in Santa Claus more than I ever have. And I'll never forget, Stan, she turned and she looked, and you can hear her, she looked at me and she said, no, you don't. And I said, can I tell you a story? And I told her about a young man in Turkey who loved, who loved people, especially children, who had hard lives. His name was Nick. I told her the story of how Nicholas grew into a man who gave gifts to children who didn't want any recognition. He just wanted children to be happy, and he gave gifts, leaving them at their window silently. And I told her about how through the years, instead of joining him in that process, people decided it was easier to make a hero of him and build a statue than to live his life. And I told her about how we human beings, when we can't bear the weight of our own glory and our own goodness, and we're fearful to follow those rubrics, it's easier for us to build legends and myths. We build Rosa Parks a statue rather than live her life. We laud and we worship people instead of following them because it's just too much for us. We can't stand how good we might be, so we project it onto religious heroes and we create our Santa Clauses and our gods. And I told her about this Santa Claus and I told her about how finally and fully I realized this was a projection of our own goodness and these stories were actually, they were not portraits we painted of another life. They were pictures and reflections of ourselves that we could not bear. And I didn't say it quite that fancy, but I said it in a way that an 11-year-old heart opened and she got it. And we began singing Santa Claus is coming to town again. And I just wanted to come today and say post-evangelical, liberal, progressive Christianity, whatever it is in any form. For me, sitting around the campfire of that dissolution and letting go of all things at that, at that, at that painful tomb, I remember the years of thinking, oh my God, all of this was a crock of you know what, I have been duped. And yet, I couldn't leave. And I thought it was sentimentality and nostalgia, but come to find out, something finally came out of that grave that tells me all of that stuff that I used to think literalistically and dualistically, it's actually not less than all of that. It's more. And it's deeper. And it's richer. Joni Mitchell sang the song well for 40 years, but I'll give you some homework from the message. Go home and get on the World Wide Web and look up Joni Mitchell, both sides now. And know this, she wrote the song when she was 24, and as does the muses among us, they inspired her to write a song that she hadn't even known how to live yet or could fully comprehend what she was writing. At 24 years old, she wrote the song, Both Sides Now, Go pull up online a picture of her in a flowery dress in 1972 with a guitar singing that song, and it took her, Casey, two and a half minutes because she sang it, Peter, Paul, and Mary. I've looked at life from both sides now, and she didn't even know what she was singing, though she wrote it. 
and then go pull up 40 years later at the Kennedy Center when she's been awarded and she comes out after 40 years of two packs of cigarettes a day and strokes and fighting cancer and divorces and heartbreaks. Go listen to her sing it 40 years later with a voice resonant and deep, altoed by life. Doesn't even sound like her, and yet it's so richly and deeply her. And there at those awards, as she sung it, the song took her seven minutes to sing. Because she sung it with the gravitas of experience. And this is the song she sang. She sang the song of moving from first naivete to sophistication and criticism. And then finally, from that place, bereft of peace and comfort and awe and wonder, being called again to second naivete. She sang first about clouds and then about love. Listen, and I'll leave you with this. First naivete. Rows and flows of angel hair and ice cream castles in the air. <sighs> Feathered canyons everywhere. I've looked at clouds that way. Criticism. The four-year-old gazing at the sky grows up and her heart's broken a million ways. But now they only block the sun. They rain and snow on everyone. So many things I would have done. But clouds got in my way. Second naivete. You get tired enough there. You get tired of being mad and wounded and a victim. You get tired of a wideness of mind that constricts the heart and you open your heart again for the real new birth. I've looked at clouds from both sides now, from up and down, <sighs> and still somehow, it's clouds illusions I recall. I really don't know clouds at all. Love, first naivete, love. Moons and Junes and Ferris wheels. <sighs> the dizzy dancing way that you feel when every fairy tale comes true. I've looked at love that way. Divorces and heartbreaks and a bed shared with a million miles between two souls. And moons and Junes and Ferris wheels are replaced with... But now it's just another show. You leave them laughing when you go. And if you care, don't let them know. Don't give yourself away. I've looked at love from both sides now, from give and take. And still somehow, it's love's illusions I recall. I really don't know love at all. So Grace Point, keep being a great place for people to fall apart at the feet of Jesus. Keep being a great place for the bitter, jaded, angry people with wounds agaping and trying not to be septic. Pour antibodies into those wounds. But be a good place for people who've lived there long enough and want to open their hearts again to awe and wonder who want to have something to sit down with their old mom with Alzheimer's and think, you know what she's talking about, streets of gold and mansions fair. I may not believe it exactly that way, but I don't believe it less. And we might actually believe closer to the same thing than I ever thought we did. So I'm looking for the heart now more than the head. I think Grace Point can be a place for both of those things, don't you? Yes. Amen. Thank you.
Thank you for being with us today. Stan, what an amazing message. Thank you for that. Um, yeah. We love you. We hope you have a good week, and we'll see you, see you back next time. Have a good one.